Welcome! In this video, we'll cover types and type classes in Haskell, and I'll be roughly following the corresponding chapter in the Learn UA Haskell tutorial. As I mentioned in the introductory video, Haskell has a static type system, so it's a strictly typed language. This means that every expression and function has a specific type. For instance, when we're defining functions, we always need to say what the input and output types of the function are. The advantage of having such a type system is that it allows Haskell to reason about your code. In particular, it's able to find errors in your code during compilation. For example, if you're trying to call a function that takes integers and outputs integers, and you're trying to call this using like a Boolean in your code, then the code won't even compile. Haskell will complain and give you an error. This is good because it means that Haskell can find mistakes in your code before actually running the code. So in many cases, if your Haskell code compiles, you won't be encountering any runtime errors later on. In addition, Haskell can also give you helpful suggestions on what is wrong in your code if it finds errors, and it can do so in a more specific manner because of the type system. The disadvantage of having such a type system is, of course, that it adds an extra layer of complexity when you're writing code, so you need to always say what like the type of your functions is. Luckily, Haskell has very solid type inference, which means that it can usually guess what the type of your function is supposed to be. And so this means that actually you don't always have to declare types if you don't want to, or you can just take the suggestions that Haskell gives you. Another disadvantage of the strict type system is that Haskell is very picky about um, you know, what values you can apply functions to. And if you're coming from a language like Python, which doesn't enforce any sort of typing, this can take some getting used to and can be very frustrating at first. So if you're having trouble with the typing at first and you think it's all very annoying and stupid, well, this is normal. Um, I hope that though, once you get used to it, you'll find that having this extra constraint is actually very um, helpful when you're writing code. In particular, it requires that you think more deeply about what you're actually trying to do when you write the definition of a function, and it'll also help you catch errors in your thinking. So overall, actually, the type system will probably save you time because if you avoid stupid errors in your code that Haskell can find for you, well, then you won't be spending a lot of your time debugging the code and trying to chase down errors that you don't know where they're originating from. So at least for me, when I'm writing code in Python, for example, a lot of my time is spent you know, trying to figure out why the program isn't doing what I want it to do. And usually, the cause of the error is something that you would have been able to find if you had like explicitly declared types everywhere. In any case, despite the initial hurdle, I've really come to appreciate this typing of functions, and I hope that you'll also find that it's very helpful. OK, so let's get started with exploring the type system in Haskell. So I'm going to open a terminal and run ghci. Now in ghci, we have a neat command which allows us to get the type of any expression we type in. And the command is colon t. For instance, if I run colon t and then this a surrounded by single parentheses, I get the message that this expression here has type character. So these two colons in Haskell uh, mean has type or is of type. And the care here is the type of characters in Haskell. So as we saw in the previous video, in order to get characters, you surround some, some letter in uh, single parentheses. Similarly, the type of true is bool. So true is of type bool. So bool is the type for Boolean values in Haskell. We can also check the type of something like hello. And this gives me a string. Next, let's check the type of a list containing some Boolean values. So let's do true and false. In this case, we see that this list containing Boolean values is of type list of bool. So uh, in order to have a list type, you surround the type which is contained in the list by these square parentheses. A similar thing happens for tuples. So if I have a pair where let's say the first element is a character and the second element is a Boolean, I see that this has type a tuple where the first argument is of type character and the second argument is of type bool. With these type signatures, it should now also be clear why you can't put multiple um, objects of different types in a list because the type of the list is just a list of Booleans. So it doesn't make sense to have anything else besides Booleans in the list. 
Whereas with uh, tuples, we can put um, different types into different positions. And this is reflected in the fact that for each position in the tuple here, we give a type for that position. On the other hand, this means that the length of such a tuple is predefined. Okay, so we've seen that some basic expressions in Haskell have these types. Now, of course, um, the thing we're going to be working with mostly are functions, and they also have types. So I'm now going to show you how to declare types for functions. So let's recall the simple function we had, double me x is equal to x plus x. So this is just a function which doubles its argument. And now, in fact, the thing that's uh, suggested for me here in VS Code is already the inferred type for this function. Now, because we don't yet know all of the concepts that are present in this inferred type, for example, this num a and what this a means and so on, I'm going to just define a simpler type for this function. So uh, the way to do this is to write the name of the function and then this double colon. So we would say that double me has type and now I need to write the type signature for the function. And in this case, I'm going to define it as being a function that takes an int and outputs an int. So again, to give the type signature, you first, before the definition of a function, you write the name of the function, then you write these double colons to say has type, and then you put the input and output types of the function separated by this arrow here. And the way to think about this is that you give this function an int, and then it converts it into an int. This is exactly what's happening here. Double me x, I give it some integer, and then it spits out another integer, which is twice the size of the original one. Okay, so I saved my script and now I'm going to load it in order to test my function. So I do colon L for load, then types.hs, which happens to be the name of this file. It's going to compile. Okay, and now I can test double me, let's say five, gives 10 as intended. On the other hand, because I've now made a rather restricted uh, definition for the types of this function, if I try to do double me 5.0, this won't work because 5.0 is a floating point number and not an int. And so I get an error because we don't know how to apply this function to a float. We'll see later how to adjust the type definition here to allow it to take both integers and floating point numbers. But for the moment, if we wanted to declare it with these explicit types here and not use type variables like we will later, we'd have to write like a second version of this function to handle floats. So I'll call this double me prime. So this takes a float and outputs a float. And the definition uh, double me prime of x is just the same, it's x plus x. Okay, if I now uh, reload my script, so I saved and reload it with colon r, then this again compiles. Now I can test, so double me prime of 5.0. So that works, that gives me 10.0. On the other hand, double me prime also works with five. And the reason is that five can be interpreted as a floating point number, but uh, 5.0 can't be interpreted as an int. So here there's some coercion going on. This five I'm putting in the double me prime is actually being coerced to 5.0 and then we apply double me prime. Okay, but as I said, we'll see a much better way of defining double me to accept arbitrary numbers by using type classes in just a moment. Okay, so we've seen how to declare types of functions that take a single argument. And I hope that this arrow notation is intuitive for that. I'll now show you how to declare functions that take multiple arguments. So I'm going to consider this function called add us, which just adds its two arguments. So it's defined as add us x, y is equal to x plus y. Now here's the suggested type signature for this function by Haskell, but I'm now going to uh, declare a a custom type signature, which is simpler. So add us will have type int to int to int, like so. And this is maybe a bit less intuitive than the simple arrow notation for single argument functions. So the way to read this is that the rightmost uh, type here is the return type. And then everything to the left of this arrow here are the input types and the input types are separated by arrows. So in this case, the first occurrence of int refers to x, and the second occurrence of int here refers to the argument y. So x has type int, y has type int, and the return type is int. 
Now there's a deep reason for why this notation makes sense, and I'll briefly try to explain a bit why this is the case. We'll see this in more detail later when we talk about partial application of functions, but I'm going to sort of just give you the quick version of it. But if you don't quite understand what's going on here, don't worry about it. You can always just remember that the last argument is the return type, and then you separate all of the input types. So of your arguments you're giving the function, you put them on the left, and you separate them by arrows. Okay, so here's the brief explanation for why this notation makes sense. So in fact, what I wrote here is the same or is interpreted by Haskell as this type. Namely, this would be a function type which takes an integer and then returns not a single integer or anything, but it returns a function which itself takes an integer and returns another integer. The way to understand this is that add us xy is actually computed in two steps. So if we give it two arguments like this, so let's say I do add us 3, 4, then first add us 3 is evaluated and returns a function which can take another integer and in the end returns an integer. So add us 3 itself is like a function which can take a new integer, in this case 5, and return an integer namely 8, which is the sum between 3 and 5. So I'll illustrate this um, in the console down here. So I'm going to reload my script. So I can do add us, let's say, 3 and 5. Okay, so that gives me 8. Now what I was trying to say before is that, in fact, if we write something like this, Haskell will actually interpret it as the following. So first it evaluates add us with the first argument, which is 3. And this evaluation returns a function which has type int to int, so it can take another integer and output an integer. So in fact, if I do this, it's exactly the same as writing add us 3, 5. So what is this function here, add us 3? Well, this is like a partial evaluation of this add us function. So it's a function which always adds 3 to whatever number you give it. So somehow it's like the addition function, but we've fixed the first argument of the addition. So basically, the way you could think about this is like the function 3 plus y. So it takes some y and it just adds 3 to it. So somehow we've already substituted in 3 for the x in add us, and now we're going to get a new function which just adds 3 to any other number we give. And if you actually check the type of this partial evaluation, add us 3, we see that it indeed is a function of type int to int, so it's a function which takes an integer and outputs an integer. So in general, it's possible to think about functions of multiple arguments as sort of being functions that return, again, functions, uh, just like here. So a function of two arguments can be thought as a function that takes in its first argument and outputs a function which takes the second argument and then outputs the return type. And under this interpretation, this type signature should now make sense because it's something that takes something of type int and returns a function, namely this partial evaluation, add us x, that takes in a y and returns an int. Now because it's a bit of a hassle to always write these brackets, by default, um, the, this operator here, so this arrow operator, associates to the right. So writing this without the brackets is equivalent for Haskell as if you write it with the brackets. And just removing the brackets re removes some clutter. In fact, this process of interpreting a function of multiple arguments as a function which again outputs a function is called currying, which is incidentally the last name of Haskell Curry, which is the mathematician and logician who uh, Haskell, the language, is named after. Again, this was just a very brief explanation of this partial function application and currying. If you're interested, I hope that this was enough to figure out on your own exactly why this type signature makes sense. If you're not interested, you can just forget about it for the moment, and you can uh, just think about this pattern as being, well, the two things here on the left are the inputs, and then the thing on the right is the output. Okay, so now let's move on to describing some basic types in Haskell. So, so far, um, we've seen some types for numbers. So there's int, then there's integer, and then there's float and uh, double. So these are common number types in Haskell. So int and integer both describe 
like whole numbers, which can be either negative or positive. The difference between these two is that int has a fixed precision. So there's like some largest value of int, which you can give Haskell and some smallest value. In fact, you can find out what this is by typing in max bound of type int. And you'll see that, well, this is the maximum bound that ints have on my system. So it's a pretty big number. Probably you're not going to be reaching this anytime soon if you're doing stuff. On the other hand, integer is unbounded. So in principle, integers can be as big as you have memory on your system. So if you're working with really, really big numbers, um, you should probably use integers, but ints are better because they have a fixed size and therefore they're more efficient. In a similar manner, float and double are both floating point numbers. However, they have different amounts of precision. So double has double the precision of a float. So you can express numbers up to a higher degree of accuracy if you're using doubles. For instance, we can see exactly how much precision we have by looking at pi in either as a float or as a double. So if you want to force a specific thing to be of a certain type, you can put a type declaration after it. So if I do pi of type float, so pi is a constant which is already defined in Haskell. So if I say I want it of type float, it'll put it as a float. And you see I have this many decimal places. Whereas if I want to look at pi as a double, I see I have twice as many uh, decimal places. Probably you don't lose much efficiency if you work with doubles instead of floats. So if in doubt, you should probably just use doubles. Other than these default number types, there are also other number types which are defined either directly in Haskell or in uh, libraries which you can load. For example, there is a type for rational numbers, which gives you like exact representations for rational numbers and so on. Okay, so then there are some more types which we've already seen. So we've seen bool, which is the Boolean uh, values, which can be either true or false. And then we saw characters. So these are things like A and single quotes. And finally, we also saw strings, which are lists of characters. And then there's lists of things. So for any pre-existing type, we can form a list of that type. So the way to do this is to put square brackets and then put whatever type you, you want inside the square brackets. For example, we could have a list of characters. And in fact, this is the same as a string. Okay, and aside from lists, there are also tuples. And the way to put those is to add your types like this between round parentheses separated by commas. For example, we saw before a tuple which had the first argument being a Boolean and the second one a character, like so. Now these are basically all the types we'll need. The next topic we'll look at are type variables which allow us to define functions in a more general manner where we don't give concrete types, but we sort of say what the function does for every possible type we give it. As an example of this, remember the head function. So head takes a list, for example, a list containing two booleans, and it returns the first value in that list. But notice that the same function also works for a list of numbers for example, head of four or five gives me four. So at the same time, head works on a list of booleans, but also on a list of numbers. And the reason for this is that if we examine the type of head, we see that its type isn't declared with concrete types, but instead it uses this type variable A. So what this type signature is saying is that head is of type, well, it's a function type which takes a list of A's and returns an A. As a result, this means that we can call this function, for example, on a list of booleans. In that case, this concrete instance of the function would take a list of bool and return a single bool, in this case, true. Whereas if we call this function on a list of numbers, let's say these are two ints, then head will take a list of ints. So a would be int in that case, and we return a single int, namely four. A similar thing happens for first. So recall that first, is a function which takes a pair and returns the first element of the pair. If we check out what the type of first is, we see that it's something which takes a tuple with a in the first component and b in the second component, and it returns something of type a. 
So this means that first can in fact take an arbitrary pair, which has an arbitrary type A as its first component and an arbitrary type B as its second component, and it'll return something of the type of the first component. So in this way, we can use these type variables to write functions which don't have to have fixed types. So where the types could be variable, and this means that we can apply them to more types than just a single one. In this case, these functions are called polymorphic because they can have several different instantiations for every type. Now using these type variables, we could attempt to write a more general version of double me, which in this case I'm calling double me double prime because we already have uh, the other two versions defined above. So I again want to define this as being x plus x, but now I'd like to give it a more general type signature. So double me double prime is now of type. So I want it to be something like a goes to a so that I could insert any sort of type for x. So with this type signature here, with this type variable a, this would now be a function which takes an a and returns an a. However, if I try to save my script and reload it, I'm going to get an error. And the problem is this plus which occurs in this function definition. So if you uh, read the error code here, it says no instance for num er arising from the use of plus, and then it suggests a possible fix. So add num a to the context of the type signature for double me double prime, okay? The problem here is that even though I'm declaring double me as being able to take an arbitrary type and output an arbitrary type, this actually isn't possible because in the course of defining double me, I've used this plus here, and in general, we can't add arbitrary types. Therefore, this definition down here only makes sense if x has a type which can be added. And thus, Haskell is recognizing this and telling us that our type signature for, for this function doesn't make sense because in general, an arbitrary type A can't be added to itself. Now, in fact, the error message here is helpfully suggesting what we need to do in order to fix it. What I need to do is I need to add a type constraint on this function. So I need to constrain the type of A to be of some sort of type which can be added. And this is exactly what type classes do. So here I've added this type constraint, which in this case is num a, followed by this double arrow, which you get by typing an equal and then a greater than sign. So what this thing is doing here is it's constraining the type of a to be of type class num. And so type classes are basically collections of specific types that all have similar properties. In this case, num is the type class for numbers, and it includes all of these number types I told you about above. So what this signature here is now saying is that double me double prime can take an arbitrary type A, but that type has to be of type class num. If I now save the script and I reload it, I see that it compiles fine. And the reason for this is that now, whenever I have something of type class num, in particular, it can be added. And so now this uh, type signature makes sense because I'm not trying to do an operation on the arbitrary type A that isn't guaranteed to work. Let's maybe see another example that uses this type of type class constraint. So let's check the type of this comparison operator equals here. So remember that we can do things like four equals equals five and that'll return false but we could also compare, let's say, two strings with one another or two characters with one another. So this suggests that this function here is defined using type variables, and this is indeed the case. So we see that in the type signature for this equals operator, we have a, a going to bool. So this is something that takes two arguments of type a and returns something of type bool. For instance, here, if I call it with four and five, it'll take to integers, so a would be int, and then it returns a boolean, namely false. But on the other hand, I could also call it with, let's say, characters, so then a would be characters, so it takes two characters, compares them, and returns a boolean. However, we can see that in the signature, we also have this type class constraint called ek a. Ek is the type class for all types that can be compared using the equality operator. 
In fact, all of the types we've seen up here can actually be compared using equality, and therefore they're part of this very large type class ek. There are, however, types in Haskell that can't be compared, so aren't part of the ek type class, for example, functions. The reason for this is that for two functions to be equal, they would have to give the same output for any argument you give them. And well, if there are infinitely many possible arguments, then you can't check this in practice. Okay, so I hope the concept here is clear. We can use these type variables to write more general versions of functions that are polymorphic. However, oftentimes we'll be using certain operations in the definitions of our function that don't apply to all types. And therefore we need to constrain the types that are allowed by using these type classes. So let me now give you some examples of type classes. So we have ek, ord, show, and read. Maybe I should put these on a separate line since they're a bit different. So as I mentioned before, ek is the type class which um, supports comparison. So in ek we can test whether two elements of ek are equal or not. On the other hand, ord is the type class for ordered types. So these are types that support the comparisons greater and less than and greater and equals and less than equals, as well as having equality. So ord is in fact like a subclass of ek, meaning that any instance of ord also has to be an instance of ek. So whenever you're able to compare something with greater and less than and less than or equal and greater than equal, then you also should be able to compare it using just equality. Then I also mentioned these type classes show and read. So show is the type class for all types which can be printed in some way. In fact, there's a function show, which uh, if you say do show three, it prints the string three. And well, if we do show true, it prints the string true. So the show type class is capable of representing its objects as strings. On the other hand, there's read, which is sort of the opposite of show. So objects that have type class read support the read function which allows you to convert strings into objects of that type. For instance, I can do read five. So this is like the reading in the string five minus two, and this returns three. At this point, I should mention that types can have several type classes. For example, we see here that int is at the same time of type class read, show, and ek, and ord. Okay, then there's another type called enum. So these are types that can be enumerated, which means that they support the successor function. So there's always a successor defined for each type in enum. For instance, again, integers are of type enum because you can always get a successor to each integer. Then there is a general type class for numbers called num. So this is something we saw above. So this includes all of the, these types here. So int, integer, float, and double. And in fact, if you type in any sort of number just in GHCI, like five, you'll see that in fact, it's just defined as being of the type class num. It's not yet assigned a specific type. So it's not yet assigned like int or integer or float or double. And this means that in fact, you can coerce um, these numbers here into specific types. So I can get five back as an int. I could fi get five back as an integer or I could get five back as a float by using this type annotation here. And you see that, well, okay, ints and integers are printed in the same way, but in the case of a float, I print it as 5.0. So this object five, if I just type it in like this, this doesn't yet get assigned a definitive type. It's just a, an object of the general type class num until we say specifically what we want it to be. As an example of a function that uses um, the type class num, we already saw addition, but here's multiplication. So multiplication is something that takes two arguments of type A and returns something of type A, but those arguments have to be in the type class num in order for multiplication to be defined. So things of type class num, they have these multiplication, addition, subtraction, and so on defined on them. Then there are two more type classes for numbers. There's integral, which covers int and integer, and then there's floating, which covers float and double. So if you want to be more specific about, you know, using either floating point numbers or integral numbers, then you can 
use either of these type classes rather than the more general type class num. Okay, I'm going to wrap this video up by showing you a very useful function called from integral. What this function does is it converts something from the integral type class into a more general type in the num type class. And this is useful if I want to convert, say, an integer into something which can then be used as a floating point number. So if I check what the type is of from integral applied to this five interpreted as an integer. So here five, this is the int five, and I'm now applying the from integral function to it and checking the type of what's returned. I see that what's returned is something of type num b. So it's a something of type class num. In fact, if we look at the general type signature of from integral, we see that it's something that converts something of type A into type B. So here we have two type variables occurring, and we have some constraints on them given here before this double arrow. And you can see that it's possible to add multiple type class constraints by putting them in parentheses and then separating them by a comma. So here, type the type of a needs to be in the integral type class, whereas the type b needs to be in the num type class. So we can see that from integral takes something in the integral type class and converts it to something in num. Now, why is this useful? Well, there are cases where you want to convert from ints to floats. For instance, uh, let's say I calculate the length of some list so if I get the length of this list, it's two. And in fact, the type of this uh, number, so this length will be int. So the length function is just defined in a way that it always returns an int. But now it's possible that I want to use the length of this list in some calculation where I need it to be a float. For instance, suppose I want to divide the length of this list here by three, okay? Now, if I tried to do this just without converting it into a float, I get an error. The reason for this is that division here is not defined when the first argument is an integer. So the division only works when both of the arguments we give it are of a type class called fractional and the int isn't of that type class. Thus, in order to make this work with the standard division function, we need to first convert this length, which is an int, into um, something of a more general type class, which can then be coursed into something that can be divided. And this is exactly what the from integral function does. So we can do from integral and then do length of this list. And then this thing here, which uh, is outputted by the from integral function now is of a more general type class num and this can be uh, put into the division function and then that'll actually return the result we expect. Okay, so remember that whenever we want to convert like an int into a float or something, we can use this from integral and often we'll use it in combination with length because the way length is standardly defined, so if you look at the type signature of length, it outputs something of type int. I think the reason that it's standardly defined as outputting an int is for efficiency reasons or something. But if you wanted your length function to be more compatible with other functions, it would be good to define it in such a way that it like outputs an arbitrary type B, which is in type class num, and then you wouldn't always have to go like converting it if you wanted to use it for, for things which don't work with ints. With that, I'm done with what I wanted to say in this video. I hope that this has given you some overview of the type system in Haskell. Don't worry about it if things are not completely clear yet. From now on, whenever we define functions, we'll also be explicitly declaring their types. And so we'll get a lot of practice for writing type signatures um, from now on whenever we write code. With this material, we now have all of the necessary background knowledge under our belt in order to start writing interesting functions. And that's what we'll be doing in the next video where we'll be exploring